Let me get to Jim Jackson, NBA on TNT. Jim, do you have all your trading cards when you were playing? Did you collect uh, your your cards? Well, you know, it's a lot of cards to collect with different teams. How many I played for? <laughs> <laughs> How much do you get paid by the card companies? Uh, I mean. It's, I'm not telling you how much I get paid. It's well, you know what? It, it's it's an amount. I'm with Panini, and we'll do stuff because they're you know sponsored with, not sponsored. They're sponsored of the NBA. So uh, my rookie card, my second year card, some other cards. I'll do something on a yearly basis. Where we'll sign a bunch of cards and okay, some uh, individual signatures. But it, it's a good gig though. Are any my of- mother has my mother has a lot more than I do. Of you, yeah, just you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Any of them worth a lot of money? No. <laughs> <laughs> All right. At least you're honest. <laughs> yeah. All right. So help me understand the Boston Celtics. Do they have a style offensively? Because I I'm trying to figure it out. Like, yeah, yeah. What, what is yeah. what is their offense? It, it works sometimes, and sometimes it doesn't. Well, and and that's because. You know, when you look at this Boston team and kind of the things that they fought over in the past of trying to establish, uh, especially Tatum and Brown as young players in this league, when you're young, you want to establish that that bravado that you can play, that you belong, that you deserve the contract, that you deserve the accolade. And sometimes that conflicts with the overall offensive scheme. I think Brad Stevens had an issue with that. Ime Udoka had an issue with that at the beginning. But it kind of started to evolve into this team atmosphere when the ball moved. You remember when Boston was playing uh, before Kyrie, when the ball was hopping around and the Boston Celtics looked, this was maybe uh, J- uh, Jalen and the Jason's rookie year. They got the Eastern Conference final. And the, even some of the second year, the ball was just moving. That's the style I think Ime wants to play. A lot coming from San Antonio where the ball doesn't stick. The problem is, trying to change that within a year structure. I can't have everybody on the same plate. When you see Boston play like they did last night, you're like, well, well why can't they do it all the time? Well, it's a level of offensive maturity that, that they have to get to. And if you find success in it, hopefully it extends that. And that's the mantra that you play with all the time instead of fighting it. So that it, it's a very legitimate question on what, when you ask that. There was a moment, I've mentioned this a couple of times uh, in previous hours, where Jalen Brown has Draymond Green on him. Mm-hmm. And and there's going to be a pick set where there's going to be a switch where Jalen Brown's going to be guarded by Steph Curry, which would be a big big advantage, you would think, for yep. Jalen Brown. Mm-hmm. He waves off the pick. He doesn't need the pick. He beats Draymond off the dribble. And then another time on the wing, a couple plays down, a couple plays later, beat him off mm-hmm. the dribble left-handed. I... I I'm not sure who Draymond thinks he is now, but the Boston Celtics aren't that concerned about him as far as the player, maybe the agitator, but not the player. You agree? Well, but Dr- yeah, I, I agree with this. Draymond is best to defensively off the ball when he's helping in, taking charges, defensive rebounds. Uh, there was a point in time when he was a very good on-ball defender, meaning that he could stay in front. But right now, being a little bit older in age of wear and tear, guys are able to break Draymond down a little bit more. Now, here's the difference, too. I think a lot of times when the ball moves side to side and then you attack Golden State's defense or any defense is not said, that's when you have better angles, you have better chances to get in, but then you also time and score when you go. But Jalen Brown, Jason Tane, they did a great, I think great job last night of exploiting when they went quick against whether it was Draymond Green, whether it was Steph, whether it was Otto Porter even at times against Clay, where they identified where the opportunity was and they took advantage of it. All right, if you're Golden State, what do you do? Uh, well, it's not a lot of adjustment. You got to stop turning the ball over, honestly. I mean, we always credit Golden State with this. We say this is a team that, you know, highly intelligent. They're an experienced team. They know how to play. But yet and still, you scratch your head at times, then it's like, why would you turn the ball over? I mean, you had momentum coming off the third quarter, but immediately at the beginning of the fourth quarter, it's like four quick turnovers. And these things are un- I mean, these things are avoidable. You're going to turn the ball over, don't get me wrong. But these live ball turnovers and some of the mental mistakes you see when Steph threw it, tried to throw it half court, full court, it got 
And that was coming off of another turnover right before. Yep. So you took all that momentum away that you got in the third quarter and turned it over. So to me, you value the basketball. And secondly, what they did to win game two in a lot of their games, they controlled the pain. Listen, they got out Boston at 52 points in the pain. Okay. And going see that 26. Different between the game right there. Boston was a more physical team. They got inside the paint, whether that was layup, second shots, fast break opportunities. Those are the things you got to clean up if you go to state. But that's why I didn't understand this, that the Celtics are a far bigger team. And mm-hmm. your two best players can get to the hoop off the dribble. And I would be taking advantage of that. I, I would just – I know they love to shoot the threes. Of course. But, man, I got to – I, I want to beat you inside, get you in foul trouble. I, I want to make you pay every single time down the floor. But isn't that too easy? But that's the simple way, right? That, that, that would be a little bit too easy. But when you look at the number, it tells you, okay, you got 52 points in the paint. How did you get it? Again, a combination of fast break points, off the, dr- off the dribble, Second shots. It's not like you're getting 52 points and you're posting up. That, that's not happening. Yeah, yeah. Robert Williams, offensive rebound. The key to success to me, and this is what made Golden State so tough to stop during their championship run, and even this year. Yes, they beat you with the three, but they got a lot of layups. They got a lot of second shots. And yes, the three is a potent weapon, but when you come down to winning the championship, you really watch it. Those two-point conversions, when you just keep getting them, keep getting them, and your opponent doesn't, and yeah. they're missing, guess what? You start to extend that lead. Yeah. And, and that's what Boston was able to do. I mean, but, again, it, it's so simple sometimes. Throughout, look, two plus two still equal four to me. It, it really does. Jim, there was a moment last night where the everybody was on the perimeter. It's almost like if they could have been out of bounds, they would have been out of bounds. <laughs> and I wondered, right. where would Shaquille O'Neal be? If I just on dropped the, him on the in, perimeter. if if I Shaq would be on the perimeter, yeah, you, you know why? I had this um, conversation with Alonzo Morning. He said, "Well, if I played today in today's game, I would be doing this." And I said, "No, you wouldn't." He said, "Well, why wouldn't I?" I said, "Because from the time that you were 12, 13 years old, you wouldn't be playing in the post, so you wouldn't be a you wouldn't be the same Alonzo Morning. You wouldn't be the same Shaquille O'Neal. Shaquille would be, I think, more of a hybrid like Joel Embiid." because of his skill set. Now, I don't know if he could be, will be able to shoot the same way, but he would grow up shooting the basketball, picking and popping. He wouldn't grow up on the post. And the same can be said vice versa, Dan. You know, you have this conversation all the time. People say, well, Steph couldn't play back in the day. I'm like, well, why couldn't he? Muggsy Bowles did. D. Brown did. Mark Price did. Uh, uh, Michael Adams did. Isaiah. Spud Webb did. Isaiah, and you know why? They grew up in the era where playing in the playground and playing physical, playing outside at the park, was a, in the alley, was a part of their DNA. So Steph, if you take him back, he would have been taught to play that way. You can't take Steph game right now and say, plug it back into 1985 or 1990. Because him growing up, he would have been taught to play the game a lot different. He's uh, NBA on TNT analyst, the uh, Clippers analyst as well. Jim Jackson joining us on the program. Yeah, this whole debate where Cedric Maxwell was saying to Draymond Green, you know, back in our day, they'd, they'd rough you up a little bit, and then Draymond saying, oh, everybody seems like they were enforcer back then. Uh-huh. Well, the thing I would say to Draymond Green is, the NBA would never let you rough up Luka Doncic the way the Pistons roughed up Michael Jordan. They would nope. never let you mm-hmm. rough up the nice players, the popular players. The best player in the game under the NBA rules at the time, they had the Jordan rules, that they had yep. the best player and they were beating him up. That's the difference, I think, that Draymond has to understand. Not everybody was Rick Mahorn. Not everybody, you know, was this tough guy. But these teams made you pay if, if you were on a roll. You go to the hoop, you may get knocked down. But it was just called basketball back then. It, it was, but, it, you know, each era always has its iteration. What's your favorite era of music, Dan? 70s, 60s, 60s. Right. So mine is like 80s, 90s, hip-hop, R&B. And the reason why is because it's nostalgic to me. That's what I grew up. A lot of my growth period was during that time. 
when I was younger watching stuff and listening to music. And when I hear it now, it brings me back yeah. to those nostalgic times, good or bad. And it's the same thing with sports when we grow up. So we don't want to let the past go in regards to what we felt helped mature us at a time in our life. So we want to stick with it and say, this time was better. This, listen, I'm a historian, bro. I love to travel. I love to see old buildings. Some old buildings are awesome. Some old buildings are not. Some of the newer buildings right now are just fabulous. But it, history and games, they can't stay the same. David Stern understood that the NBA understood this game was going to be international. Look at MLB, look at hockey, look at NFL, what? You want more scoring, you want more excitement. All the, these professional sports have changed in order to bring a lot more excitement, freedom of movement, whether that's in, in hockey, whether that's in football, you want to be able to throw the ball downfield because you want more scoring. That's just how it is. So I'm not one of those guys, older guys, who, well, you know, back in the 90s and this is this and these guys can't play. No. You know, the game has to change in order for it to survive and get better and get new fans. And that's what the NBA has done. Which team would be the best team in the NBA if I took away the three-point shot? Phoenix. Like they were. Because they shoot a lot of mid-range shots between Chris Paul and Devin Booker. Um, you have DeAndre Ayton inside who can score the ball when you give it to him. So he, and he can shoot the basketball from inside. Um, I, I, you know, if you took away the three, they didn't rely on it a lot. Now they would knock down shots. Yeah. I think their biggest thing was that they just didn't have a third guy that could beat them off the dribble, but I, I love the way Phoenix played. Uh, Darvin Ham seemed to say all the right things about Russell Westbrook. He mm -hmm. had to say all the right things about Russell Westbrook. What do you think deep down he feels about Russell Westbrook and how to make this work? I don't know. That's a good question. I mean, because Darvin has been around. I think he has a lot of respect. I think coaches come in, just like organizations say, you know what, if we get him here, I believe that with our philosophy that we can not change him, but help him see a different avenue to success. But the biggest question is this, Dan, who does Russell Westbrook ultimately want to be next year? That's, that's what it comes down to. Forget organization and the coach. Carmelo Anthony had to make that same transition. And I'm not saying Russell was there. But Carmelo had to look at himself in the mirror and say, okay, I'm Carmelo up today, not 15 years ago, 10 years but ago. But it took him a while to come to that realization. Yeah, well, of course. But the, some of the greatest players, it takes a while to get there. Because you're so accustomed to being the number one alpha, the guy that scores the basketball, and being able to do whatever you want on the court. But as you age, you're going to lose something. So the question is, when you look in the mirror, who do you see? The past player or the one that's currently playing? Because if you're stuck in the past, those habits and that mindset is not going to be changed. But if you flip the strip and say, you know, I can still be valuable at this age, but I have to understand what my role is. And that's the same thing with Russell Westbrook. His biggest asset is his confidence. His biggest downfall is his confidence at that time. So Darvin Ham can say what he wants. Jeannie Buss can say what they want. It's all up to Russell Westbrook and the mentality of what he wants to bring to the table for the Lakers this year. But I think you came off the bench, you were around 32. Does that sound about uh -huh. right? Yeah, yeah, a little bit, little bit before, too, because when I went to Portland um, my, in 98, 99, I came off the bench, which was tough, okay? But it worked. And so up and down, I, Sacramento came off the bench. Houston, I started. Miami, I started. Phoenix, I came off the bench. It's tough to keep track of all the teams you played for. Well, who are you telling? But <laughs> I tell you what, though, in every, it, <laughs> in every stop, the bank still worked. Okay. So, I mean, All that, right. That was okay. Still, that, was, that was still pretty good indication <laughs> that I was doing them. <laughs> and you, you played 13 games for the Lakers, so, you know. No, I, no, not really. I sat down for about 11. <laughs> <laughs> what was the best part of playing for the Lakers, even for those 13 games? Uh, getting to know Kobe a lot more. Really. Because I knew Kobe at 18 when he came in and competed against him and played against him. And, but when you're around a person on a daily basis, so to speak, and not to say that Kobe and I were best friends, but we had a chance to hang out and go to dinner and talk just about life and game and philosophy. And in that short period of time, I kind of knew the mindset behind 
the player. And he but averaged you, 35 a game that year. Oh, oh my yeah, oh my god. I mean, just how he prepared himself with the injuries in his body to get ready. Now, I, and, and again, Dan, I had an opportunity to play with some Hall of Fame players, whether that's Tracy McGrady, Jason Kidd, Yao Ming, um, you know, Chris Weber. Um, the list goes on on guys, Alonzo Mourne and guys I've played with. But Kobe was different, man. This dude was just, I mean, Allen Iverson played with AI, but this is his second year. Kobe was just a different animal, man. Wasn't, wasn't perfect. Didn't always say or do things the right way, which is okay. But it was that competitive nature, man. No matter who he played against, who it was, if it was a big name player, he wanted to prove, okay, I'm Kobe. You got to work up to my level. I got, okay? th- there was a game where you and Kobe combined for 57. Yeah, what I have too. He had 55. Yeah. yeah. yeah I think. <laughs> <laughs> I, hey, listen. It's all about sacrificing that, for the team. I like it. Dan, I like it. They, I, I grew into that role. It took me some time to get there. Maybe Russell Westbrook <laughs> needs to talk to you. <laughs> well, but he still, I think Russell still has a lot in the tank, but he has to understand who he is as a player and what he can bring to that team. What he did in OKC or what he did in Houston or what he did in Washington is not the same. And I will say this in defense of Russell, him going through that bad streak last year with L.A. was tough to get out of. Why? His usage rates wasn't the same. If he was in Washington and went through a four or five game bad shooting streak, he could get his way out of it because the ball would be in his hands and he could do more things. With the Lakers, the opportunities to get out of that are not the same. So you got to change your mindset. It's always great to talk to you. Thank you, bud. Hey, you know what? I want to ask a question. All right. Did you collect all of that stuff over all the years? Did somebody give them to you? Okay. So what made you, is that just, are you a hoarder or is that just something that you I, just did I was there? a hoarder before it was called a hoarder. I just collected. I never threw away anything. Well, I could tell. I, I just, I, I kept everything and uh, I just brought it here in the man cave. So, but, but you know what? It's kind of cool now when you think about it, like people hoard stuff, like you need to get rid of it. But when you have a platform like this and you can kind of put it all together, now it brings back, I mean, it, it's, it's kind of cool to see. I just wanted to know. I didn't know. Yeah. <laughs> I got an autographed Kobe jersey. Do you? Yeah. What number? Eight or 24? I got 24 all-star jerseys, says, to the White Mamba. Nice. So you know that, you know, I'm hanging in the rafters at, at, at crypto. Number 24. Yeah. 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 Me and Kobe shared a lot in top. Yeah, because that, that was your jersey before it became Kobe's other jersey. Yeah. yeah. I, I allowed him to. Nice. Go ahead. Team Thank player. You. Team player right there. Bro, that's maturity. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> Anytime. It's Jim Jackson, one of our favorites, NBA on TNT. We'll take a break. Last call for phone calls, what we learn, what's in store tomorrow. Back after this.